Hey folks, welcome to Fervent Astronomy. My name is Darren, and today we're going to give you a tutorial on how to polar align your mount with an optical polar scope. We're going to use the Fornax Mounts Light Track 2 as a test article today. However, many, if not all, of these steps will be equivalent for an equatorial mount uh, as well. My approach to this tutorial is going to be as inclusive as possible. Whether your skill level is a beginner or maybe you've just never even seen uh, an equatorial mount before and this is your first time learning how to polar align, I want to make sure that I give you all the steps necessary to understand why you're doing it and how to do it. If some of this information is already uh, known to you, if you're an intermediate user, uh, you can skip around the video, but if you're a beginner or you've never uh, polar aligned amount before, I'd highly recommend just watching the thing straight through. Now maybe you're thinking to yourself, what is this polar alignment nonsense? I read about it on a forum, the people there made it seem scary and difficult. I just want to take pictures of space. Why do I have to mess around with this stuff? Well, we'll take this globe and we'll use it to illustrate. So the world, of course, is spinning. And as it spins, it does so around a north to south axis. This spinning is the reason that we use trackers or uh, tracking mounts and that allows us to follow the sky. However, depending on where you are on the globe, the angle that you're looking out at into space is going to be different. So let's say you're at the North Pole or the South Pole. Looking straight up or straight down, you can basically have your mount completely parallel with the ground and the sky will move uh, past you in a lateral fashion. Really simple, you would just set it, pick a spot, and away you go. However, if you are, let's say, in Brazil, your zenith, the point directly above your head on the sky, isn't pointing north, isn't pointing south. It's pointing at some angle off the side of the world. And as the world spins, that point sweeps across the sky. So if you were to just point your mount straight up or just straight off in a random direction, you'll find that the movement of the tracker isn't actually tracking the stars. It'll be tracking at some kind of angle. So what we're essentially doing by polar aligning is taking our mount and we're moving it in alignment with the polar axis of the Earth. So from the mount's point of view, if not your point of view, it's going to seem like it is at one of those poles. And that's the whole reason and theory behind why we do this. Well, we have our Light Track 2 set up here, and now we need to get our polar scope. Just kidding, it's in my pocket. If this is your first time seeing a polar scope, let's give it a quick overview. It is essentially a small telescope with a mild magnification. It will usually incorporate a barrel, a housing, and an eyepiece. Inside this housing, when you look through your scope, you'll notice that there will be some type of markings. There's actually a glass disc in this housing that is etched with markings that will help you align your mount. As you rotate the barrel, this will function to focus the scope on the sky, on the stars. When you rotate the eyepiece, this will function to focus on the reticle. And so by adjusting these two uh, parts of the scope, you can both get the reticle in focus and you can get the sky in focus. Now in the case of Fornax's polar scope, there are three set screws around the edge of the housing near where the barrel attaches. These are locking screws and you can use them to ensure that once you've got the barrel focused on the sky, that it does not move. There are no locking uh, set screws on the eyepiece. It remains uh, mobile and you can adjust it as necessary. There are many different types of polar scopes and some are illuminated and some are unilluminated. And you might be wondering, what does this mean? 
Well, on the side of this particular scope, you'll notice there's one more hole in the housing. And this hole actually allows lights to transfer into uh, where the reticle is sitting. There will be a little uh, red LED light that can be screwed into the side of the polar scope. And when turned on, that light will go through the side of the glass reticle. Now, through the clear parts of the glass, it just passes on through and you don't even see it. However, when it hits the etchings, the markings on the reticle, that light will scatter and some of it will bounce up into your eye. So in that way, it actually functions to illuminate those etch marks and makes it a lot easier to polar align your mount. Now you've got your light track two set up on your tripod, you get out your polar scope, and you're going to want to put the barrel through the polar scope so that it comes out the end with the threads. This is what we use to actually attach it to our polar scope arm. Now before you do that, I want you to pause this video, go watch the polar scope collimation video that's also on the channel, and then come back and pick up where you left off. We're going to assume at this point that you know what collimation is and how to do it. So we've got our polar scope, we've got it in our adapter. We're going to take the arm and we're going to swing it out to the right hand side of the mount as viewed from the back of the mount. The reason we do this, I'll explain in a second, but you're going to want to have the polar scope in here in a way where it's as close to the central arm as possible while still giving you good access so that you can see from behind. Whether with your particular mounting arrangement uh, this works for you or whether you have to do this, that's totally fine. The next thing that you're going to do is go on the internet, open a planetarium app, and what you want to do is find the orientation of Ursa Minor at sunset in your particular location. Now why am I getting you to do this in a very specific way? Well, as the night goes on, you'll notice that Ursa Minor will actually rotate. And as the seasons pass, as time progresses, you'll notice that uh, at 10 p.m. in January, Ursa Minor is in a completely different orientation compared to 10 p.m. in April or July. And what we do by starting off here is we give ourselves the best starting point for that constellation because the way we orient the scope uh, is important to polar aligning. So perhaps we start off here if it's 10 p.m. or maybe if we don't get out till 1 a.m. we might have to start off here but the orientation of the scope relative to the constellation on the sky uh, will be necessary for our polar alignment. By having this extra uh, almost perhaps 270 degree arc that we can use, uh, that gives us a lot of different orientations through the polar scope. Now we're going to take a look at Ursa Minor and I'm going to show you uh, some of the landmarks that we're going to use to align and also uh, one of the reasons why we need to worry about rotation of our polar scope. Here I have my trusty helper and you'll notice that Ursa Minor here is uh, a bit different compared to Ursa Major. So over here we'll have Polaris. And over here we'll have Cocab. Now the line between Polaris and Cocab is roughly the line along which the North Celestial Pole uh, is located. And we use Polaris and Cocab as waypoints to help us align our mount with uh, that North Celestial Pole. So you've looked up the location an orientation of Ursa Minor on the sky at sunset in your location. And let's, for argument's sake, um, say that it's oriented like this. So Polaris on, on this side and Cocab on this side. What you're going to want to do is you're want, going to want to imagine looking through your polar scope at Ursa Minor in this orientation. 
In your polar scope, you'll notice that there is a trapezoid. You can ignore that if you're in the northern hemisphere. That is for the southern hemisphere. You'll also notice that there is a crosshair in the center of the polar scope with a long line extending out, and there will be a scale mark on there, as well as a circle uh, on that scale. <laughs> so what you want to do is imagine that Polaris is where the circle is, and then imagine that Cocab is where the uh, long part of that line is. And you're going to orient that to match the orientation of Ursa Minor. Again, at sunset in your location. So if Ursa Minor is uh, oriented like this, horizontal, you do that. If maybe Ursa Minor is a little more vertical or at some other random angle, then you're going to orient your polar scope so that it matches the orientation and location of Ursa Minor at sunset in your location. Thanks, sweetie. All right, you can go back. Now you know the orientation of Ursa Minor. So you're going to take your polar scope and you're going to put it in your mount. Swing that arm out. You're going to make sure that the orientation of your scope's reticle matches with where Ursa Minor is going to be. And now you're ready to collimate. One thing I would recommend that you do is take some tape or uh, a paint pen or something that you can use to mark. And you're going to want to mark uh, the location of the adapter relative to the polar scope arm. So let's say you have it in this orientation. You'd want to mark the arm and the adapter and potentially even the polar scope. The reason that we're going to do this is because every mount, every swing arm, every adapter and every polar scope is going to be slightly different from every other one. And the angle that your polar scope arm meets the right ascension axis on your mount might not be perfectly uh, parallel and zero degrees. There might uh, be a small fraction of a degree uh, off, up or down. Um, you might find that your adapter uh, where it meets with the polar scope arm, it's just a micron or two difference in the uh, uh, height on one side versus another. It's just the nature of manufacturing. So what we do, and the reason that we mark off our polar scope's position relative to the polar scope arm when we do our collimation, is to ensure that if we remove it, uh, put it back, if uh, it gets turned for some reason, we always know the exact orientation that it existed in when we did our collimation. This ensures that the orientation of the scope relative to the right ascension axis stays in that uh, collimated arrangement uh, because you know, perhaps if we rotate it 90 degrees one way or the other, it might actually uh, in a very, very, very small way, throw off the angle and result in an uncollimated system. Now, it is always a good idea to check periodically just to make sure uh, that nothing's got bumped or moved or twisted or what have you, uh, especially if you're a little rougher with your polar scope. However, um, typically speaking, as long as you keep uh, um, a good marking on there, you should be able to just put your polar scope back in night after night and keep on doing your alignment. There are a couple terms you're going to hear in reference to polar alignment and telescope mounts in general. And we're going to give you a little idea about what they mean if you've never heard of them before. You might hear the term alt as, alt azimuth, altitude and azimuth. And this refers to two of the uh, positionings that a mount, or in this case, a equatorial wedge can take. Altitude uh, is the vertical adjustment. 
Now, if you were at the North Pole, you would be said to have an altitude of 90 degrees from the equator. So you can think of it as the angle from the equator that your location is at. Now, where I live, it's around 53 degrees north. So I have uh, an altitude that looks uh, roughly like this. If you are at, let's say, Mexico City, then your altitude will be around 10 degrees or more like this. And if, of course, you are at the equator, um, not the most convenient place to do astrophotography, unfortunately, but uh, if you were, then you would find that your mount would be uh, basically uh, up and down horizontal, and this would be zero degrees of altitude. Now, the azimuth refers to the horizontal position. Most mounts will have some type of adjustment, uh, perhaps similar to this, uh, a push-pull system where you back off one screw or adjustment and then you uh, tighten up the other one and it will actually rotate the entire mount um, in a horizontal fashion. This is one of the two adjustments along with the altitude adjustment that we do in order to position the right ascension axis of our mount directly uh, at the same um, angle as the uh, rotational axis of the Earth. All right, well, we've got our mount uh, on the tripod, we've got our wedge, our polar scope's put together, and night's falling, and we're now ready to do our polar alignment. So we're gonna take a look at a virtual polar alignment here and give you a look through the polar scope and show you exactly what it is that you're trying to accomplish. All right, so here we have our view of Ursa Minor through our polar scope. Apologies for the change in video quality. Uh, we've now switched over to a phone looking through the polar scope. Now, one thing that I want to note right away is that the view through a polar scope is going to be uh, slightly counterintuitive. It's gonna be upside down relative to an unaided eye. That's something you're gonna to have to keep in mind and it's going to explain a few things. The other things, just for our little example here to note, of course, the stars uh, in real life will not look this large. They will be pinpoints. And the other thing uh, that I'm going to want to make note is that through our eyepiece here, we're seeing Ursa Minor in this orientation. We're actually going to be using both eyes, both our eye looking through the polar scope and an unaided eye looking at the sky. And we're gonna use double vision to overlay the image of the reticle onto the sky that we're looking at with our unaided eye. If this doesn't make sense, it will the first time you uh, actually do it. So when you are looking through this scope to align correctly, we keep both eyes open and that helps us to get the proper alignment. There's gonna be three movements that we're gonna to make to do our alignment. One, we might have to rotate the polar scope relative to the sky. For the light track two, this is accomplished by just moving the polar scope arm back and forth, and that will change the apparent angle of the sky relative to the reticle. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to use our altitude adjustments. This will bring us up and down. And then lastly, we'll use our azimuth adjustments, which will bring things left and right. Next, we're going to imagine that there is a line that connects Polaris in the bottom left with Kokab in the top right. Now, along this line, a little ways in from Polaris, uh, is the approximate location of the North Celestial Pole. Now I say approximate location because it would be quite a coincidence if it lined up perfectly on this line, but when using our squishy human eyeballs, it's basically close enough and it's about as good as we could do anyway. 
and for our purposes here it does more than a good enough job to get us aligned for some really uh, spectacular tracking accuracy. So we're going to now begin our alignment. We want to get Polaris aligned on the scale, on the reticle there, uh, between the 40 and 60. Now there is going to be a sweet spot for it. Once upon a time, that sweet spot was actually the circle you see there on the polar scope reticle. But one quirk of planet Earth and its rotation and orbit is that it's actually processing. As this procession happens, um, you actually have a change in the distance of the North Celestial Pole from Polaris. That is the main culprit why that little circle is no longer accurate. After five years or after 10 years, there's actually an appreciable difference that can introduce error into our, our alignment. This particular polar scope is designed to be used without any electronic aids. If you just got Polaris in that circle, it's probably going to be good enough, especially for a wide field. If you want to do the most accurate alignment possible, I would recommend getting some type of smartphone app such as Polar Scope Align on iOS and using that to get a corrected location for Polaris. You'd only need to do it once for any given location and it gives you two handy corrections. The first is that it will correct for that procession and the true location of Polaris. The second thing that it will do is it will actually calculate the amount of bending or lensing that the atmosphere at your location is doing to the light of the star. This is actually exactly the same thing that happens when you stick your hand in water. You might notice that it appears to bend and that it looks like it's in a different spot than it actually is. Well, in the case of the stars, our atmosphere bends the light from these stars as it passes through this atmosphere and they appear to us to be in different spots than they actually are. If you were to take away all the atmosphere from the planet Earth, you'd see that they were located in some cases a significant distance away from where they appear to be. Using these apps does give you the benefit of both of these corrections, both the corrected position of Polaris and the corrected position based on the atmospheric bending or lensing of light. Again, they are not required. They are merely a helpful convenience, but uh, if you have access to them, many of them are free. I would highly recommend taking a look and just jotting down or keeping note in your mind of where Polaris should be located. Now, one thing you can do is ignore the trapezoid at the top of the screen. That is for aligning the Southern Hemisphere. If you're in the Northern Hemisphere, we simply use this line. So we're all set up, we're out in the field, we're ready to align our mount. The first thing that we're going to do is we're gonna to want to locate Polaris and get it in the field of view of the polar scope. And using the eye that's looking through the polar scope, we're going to adjust our altitude and our azimuth until we get that scale lined up appropriately with Polaris. For the sake of this demonstration, let's just imagine that this is the correct position. Opening our other eye and making sure to look up at Ursa Minor, that will, through double vision, overlay the view of the reticle with our view of the sky. And we're going to want to make sure that the end of that reticle is adjusted, the angle is adjusted, to point at COCAB. So let's say that our alignment places it here, or let's say here. Well, we've now actually moved Polaris relative to the reticle, and we have to do a little correction. So again, we just adjust our azimuth, we adjust our altitude until we get it back, and then we double check to make sure that the reticle is still pointed at COCAB. You might have to do this two or three times to get the best alignment possible, 
but it is worth the extra minute or two of investment to kind of get things as close as possible to aligned. In the reticle, you can see that Polaris is in the, or at least centered on that circle on the reticle. And in the case of our view, just through the polar scope, that line appears to go and point off towards nothing. Uh, we know that if we are looking through the polar scope, COCAB would be somewhere in the upper right hand corner. But again, you'll see as you look through the polar scope, that double vision will overlay this illuminated reticle on the sky. And you can use that to adjust to get the proper angle. And once we have the angle set, and once we have Polaris at the appropriate spot on our reticle, our polar alignment is complete. The crosshairs, in this case, up and to the right of Polaris, that's actually indicating the approximate location of the North Celestial Pole. If we've done a, a really careful job, those crosshairs are gonna be aligned as close as possible over top that point, and we're gonna get excellent tracking. You might want to uh, leave the polar scope connected to the mount as long as it doesn't get in the way of any of your imaging equipment so that as the night goes on and the sky rotates that you can actually check and double check the location of Polaris and see if it still aligns approximately or appropriately on that scale. If it does, as it moves, we'll just imagine that it's here and then here then you know that you've achieved a good alignment and that I would imagine at that point you're getting very nice photos. If you find that it's now off in a, in a different spot, perhaps you jostled your equipment, kicked your tripod, or maybe the alignment wasn't perfect to begin with. And at that point, you'd want to stop what you're doing as far as imaging goes and just readjust things to ensure you've got the best alignment possible. And with that, we're done you've got your alignment set, you've got the rotation correct, and away you go for a night of hopefully very successful imaging. All right, folks. Well, we've covered a lot. Uh, we've gone over all the equipment, a lot of the theory. Maybe you've learned some new terms. Maybe you have a, a better understanding and visualization of what polar alignment is and why we do it. If you felt like something was missed or you need something clarified, don't hesitate to reach out. Head over to fervinastronomy.com and you can drop us a line or leave us a comment down below and uh, I'll get to them as soon as possible. And if uh, you found this video informative, please give it a like. And uh, until next time, I'm Darren, clear skies.